Hello and welcome. We are so excited to be here tonight uh, celebrating a very special event with some very special friends. Um, but before I introduce you to my gentlemen friends, I would love to tell you who I am. My name is Kelly Lynch and I am the senior brand manager Hello. for American and Heritage welcome. Chocolate. We are so <laughs> Sorry, digital flub. <laughs> Welcome to the new normal. So tonight I am excited to introduce you to my friend Adrian Miller, better known as the Soul Food Scholar. Adrian is a food writer, a James Beard Award winner, an attorney, a certified barbecue judge. Hmm, how does one get such a title? And he lives in Denver, Colorado. He also served as a special assistant to President Bill Clinton, and he was a senior analyst to Colorado Governor Bill Ritter. And last but not least, he is also a board member of the Southern Foodways Alliance, and he's just an all-around cool dude. Welcome, Adrian. Hey, Kelly. What's up? <laughs> What's up? So tonight, everyone, Adrian is going to be tracing the journey of soul food all the way from West Africa to the American West. He's going to be showing us what the people of West African heritage ate before European contact, what they ate during the Middle Passage, what was grown and eaten on plantations in the South, what they ate after emancipation, and the great migration across the United States. And we love history around here, but we also love talking about food. So Adrian's going to be sharing some of his absolute favorite soul food dishes and uh, also telling us how chocolate intersected with this special cuisine. Yeah, it's so good to be here tonight. So I'm excited to talk about soul food love and chocolate love and just, you know, all kinds of love. So ready <laughs> hey, for it. Love is what make the world, makes the world go round, right? Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> so, you know, I'd love to tell people, you know, gosh, Adrian, it's we're literally coming up on our one year friend anniversary. So I actually met Adrian um, February 27th, 2020, before we had any idea that the world was about to go bonkers. And we were all going to be living through the crisis that is COVID, um, through all of the um, social justice and unrest that we experienced last summer and we continue to experience. So gosh, Adrian, it feels like it's been a long time. It has definitely been a minute, but I'm glad this virtual format allows us to reconnect. Agreed, agreed. And one of my favorite memories is when I sat down to the table with Adrian to meet him for the very first time, he asked if we could order multiple dishes so that we could share off of each other's plates. And I was like, you know what? I know that this is going to be a friendship that endures. Because yeah. You know, and I know food brings people together. And because I work for Mars Wrigley, I know chocolate brings people together. So American Heritage Chocolate, which is the brand that I run at Mars Wrigley, is dedicated to sharing all of the stories that brought us the foods that we know and love today. Um, you know, those are the journeys, the triumphs and the trials that brought us, you know, that make us American in this country. So I'm excited that we're going to dig in and explore that today. So speaking of chocolate, I do have another friend to introduce, my friend, Professor B. Uh, this is um, our chocolate historian. Dave has actually been with Mars for the last 34 years. I, I mean, I know you can't tell from his child childlike demeanor, but for the last five years, Dave has actually been the chocolate research historian for Mars Wrigley Global. He is the one and only historian in our entire global company. Dave spends his days searching and telling the stories of chocolate's delicious past. The story that is 3,500 years old, all the way from the Amazon basin, how it made its way to the Americas, how it made its way to Europe, back to the colonies, and how it's traveled around the world today. So welcome, Dave. Hey, thanks, Kelly, for having me tonight to join you and Adrian. Adrian, great to see you. Awesome. Okay, so tonight's going to be interesting. It's going to be mouthwatering, but I do want to let you all know, please use the chat function here on YouTube. We are going to be checking the chat throughout this presentation, so please use that chat function so that we can be hearing and answering your questions. Next important announcement, we are going to be giving away an amazing gift basket. Um, so live on tonight's event, we're going to be giving away a basket with Adrian Miller's books, some American Heritage chocolate, as well as some really fun swag. 
And all you need to do is go to American Heritage Chocolates page on Instagram and comment on our most recent post. You can share your favorite chocolate story, your favorite soul food dish, or your favorite food memory. We are gonna be randomly selecting our winner at the end of the program. So please make sure to stay on um, for the whole program to see if you are a winner. So with that, so Adrian, we posted the question, does soul food need a warning label on our social media? And let me tell you, our fans had something to say. So we're gonna do something a little fun here before we get into the, the nitty gritty of your presentation. So we're gonna share those comments a la Jimmy Kimmel mean tweets. So I'm gonna set you up here. So Adrian, does soul food need a warning label? Yes, a warning that reads, better get your own plate because I ain't sharing. <laughs> All right, next up, Adrian, does soul food need a warning label? Really? Ask the people who grew up eating it. It was delicious and seasoned with a pound of love. Yum. All right, Adrian, does soul food need a warning label? <laughs> Depending on his perspective, he may or may not need his black card revoked, but the answer is nope. Oh my gosh, and last but not least, does soul food need a warning label? Heck no, you either eat it or leave it. Soul food is made with love, that's what's in it. <laughs> All right, listen, we have an impassioned community of people who wanted their voices to be heard. So thanks for sharing some of those, some of those posts. So now I will pose the question to you, Adrian. Does soul food need a warning label? Absolutely not. Um, there's really two misconceptions about soul food. The first is that it's inherently unhealthy and that the second is that it's slave food, unworthy of celebration. But the thought that soul food is unhealthy is misleading because when you actually look at the development of the cuisine, what people in the community think about um, soul food, there's two parts, there's multi parts to it. So there's a celebration food aspect of it, but then there's a lot of uh, healthy vegetables and plant based stuff that's part of soul food as well. So, um, you know, the glorious dishes like fried chicken, barbecue, the cakes that we're going to talk about later, those were for special occasions and, um, you know, celebrations. But things like dark leafy greens, you know, kale, uh, collards, mustard, turnip greens are actually very healthy. And that's a core part of the diet. So it's really about moderation and context. Excellent. So case closed, soul food does not need a warning label, right? That's right. <laughs> All right. Well, we love history around here. So let's dive in. How did soul food come to be part of our American tapestry. So it really, soul food is really the blending of the culinary ingredients, techniques, and traditions of West Africa, Western Europe, and the Americas. So we're going to kind of go through first the language of soul food and then talk about its development over time. So uh, people think soul food really started with um, the 1960s, these strong expressions of black identity, black is beautiful, black power movement. But the first joining of the words soul and food in the English language actually go back to Shakespeare. So in Shakespeare's first play, The Two Gentlemen of Verona, two characters, Julia and Lucetta, are talking about this really sexy guy named Proteus. And Proteus walks by in one scene and Julia says to Lucetta, Oh, knowest thou not that his looks are my soul's food? Pity the death that I've pined in by longing for that food so long a time. So one takeaway is that even in the late 16th century, not unusual for two girlfriends to get together and describe a guy as yummy, but for the next 400 years, soul food was really religious in its connotation. Anything to edify your spiritual life, listening to a sermon, studying scriptures, singing hymns. Then it takes a musical turn in the 1940s. And essentially black jazz artists were miffed that white jazz artists were getting the most fame and publicity and money for uh, this musical genre they felt they had created. So they took uh, jazz music to a place where they thought white musicians could not mimic the sound. And that's the sound of the black church in the rural South. So that gospel tinged jazz that emerges in the 1940s and 1950s was first described as a sound that was soulful or funky. So we could easily be calling this funky food, but soul is the one that caught on. So it was really soul music first then Soul Brothers, Soul Sisters, Soul Food. What does happen in the 1960s though is that soul food definitely becomes popular as a term, but then um, it gets divorced. So essentially soul becomes black 
Southern becomes white. And we're still reckoning with that legacy today as we try to reintegrate African-Americans into the Southern food story. So that's kind of the language of soul food, why it emerges. But now if we're going to talk about the cultural source for African-Americans, this is I trace it to this part of the world, which is West Africa. And I'm defining West Africa as a band of countries along the West Coast, on the Atlantic Coast, from uh, Senegal in the north to Angola in the south. So most people of African heritage in the United States, we trace our roots to this part of the world. Although uh, there were some enslaved Africans taken from East, overwhelmingly most people were taken from the West. Now the typical meal in West Africa is a savory soup, stew, or sauce that is served on top of some kind of starch. So in, in Africa, there are different starch traditions. So there's rice from Senegal to Sierra Leone. Um, in the middle of that region is sorghum and millet. And then you've got tropical root crops um, like yams, plantains, and cassava in Point South. So here's a meal that I had in Denver, Colorado at a West African restaurant. So on the left is something called fufu. So that's essentially a tropical yam that's been pounded down to the consistency of mashed potatoes. And then on the right are some tilapia fish steaks with a tomato, spinach, uh, melon seed, and chilies uh, sauce. So what you would break off some of that fufu and then you would uh, get some of the fish and the sauce and kind of eat it all in one fell swoop. So that's an example. Now this restaurant unfortunately closed. I think it had something to do with the, rest, uh, the restaurant's name. It was called The Palace Nigerian Food and Philly Cheesesteaks. That just didn't work. All right. <laughs> Now, hey, here's early, fusion, early fusion. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, just didn't work. Uh, here's a representation of the movement of uh, enslaved Africans across the Atlantic. This is called the Middle Passage, which could be anywhere from 10 to 12, 12 weeks, depending on where you left uh, in Africa and where you arrived in the Americas. So the enslaved were kept below deck and only allowed to come up twice a day um, for eating, bathing and exercise. So that's when a lot of the slave rebellions happened because that was the opportunity. In the early years of the slave trade, uh, European slavers fed the enslaved rotting, rotting European food, which essentially, actually, if we can go back, um, which essentially, um, you know, reduced this. There were so many deaths that um, the, the slavers ultimately changed their mind, their strategy, and started feeding the enslaved the foods that they were used to um, back in their home country. So if they had people from Senegal and Gambia below deck, they started feeding them black eyed peas and rice. Um, you know, in order to boost the survival rates. The thing to understand here is that essentially only 4% of the millions of people that come across the Atlantic eventually go to British North America. Most people go to Point South. So that's why I argue in my book that soul food is really a, West Af a Western European meal with West African influences. When you eat with someone of African heritage uh, in the Caribbean or Point South, you're having more of an African meal with West Africa, with Western European influences, because we're talking about the you know similar climates. So you could bring African foodstuffs over and transplant them here. Um, also numbers. There were a lot more Africans uh, that outnumbered the whites in the Caribbean and other places. So there was more autonomy that they had over their food. Um, so yeah, next slide. This is just an example of a newspaper advertisement in 1769. I only show you this to let you know that slavers knew who they had below deck. So this is talking about enslaved people being from the Windward Coast or Rice Country. And we now know that enslaved Africans were brought to the United States, what the British colonies and eventually the United States to build up agricultural uh, economies, especially the rice industry in the Carolinas and uh, Louisiana, which were quite lucrative uh, in their time. Next slide. This is an example of um, oversimplifying the large plantations that, you know, Tara Plantation and Gone with the Wind, that was really only 40% of where enslaved people were. They were mostly on small farms in urban situations. So in those situations, a uh, slaveholder and enslaved ate out of the same pot with food cooked by the same cook. It's really only on the lot larger plantations that you had two teams of cook, one for the big house, one for uh, enslaved people. But essentially, uh, as a sign of power, a symbol of power, uh, slaveholders controlled how much food the enslaved got. So uh, once a week, they got five pounds of some starch, cornmeal, rice, or sweet potatoes, a couple of pounds of smoked meat. It could be, it was usually pork, but it could be beef or fish, whatever was cheaper, and then a jug of molasses. So let's go to the next slide. 
So here's an example of a plantation outside of Charleston. So there's a pasture in the middle. Beyond that is where the commodity crop would be grown. But in the middle, it says Negro houses. It's kind of upside down and hard to see. But then there's numbers there. So those were the slave quarters or where the enslaved lived. And then it says Negro gardens and poultry grounds. So what we know is that enslaved people actually grew their own food and raised their own livestock. And so uh, in many cases, they were actually allowed to sell the excess uh, in nearby town on the weekends. But the typical uh, kind of food or diet for the enslaved was during the week, get up at dawn, eat out of a trough with butter filled with crumbled buttermilk, or I mean buttermilk and crumbled cornbread. And you had to eat with your fingers or a seafood shell because a fork or knife was a potential weapon. And then you go back out in the fields and do your work, come back for the midday meal, and that same trough would be washed out and filled with uh, seasonal vegetables, maybe a little meat to flavor the vegetables and water. And then you go out in the fields again, come back at sundown, and then essentially you would uh, get uh, leftovers from the midday meal, and that was called supper. So what enslaved people were eating was very close to what we call vegan today. So that's okay. a mental note. We're going to come back to that a little bit later. Excellent. So then after the great, after slavery ends, after the great, uh, after emancipation, we have millions of African-Americans going to other parts of the country for more opportunity. And essentially I argue that this is a pivotal moment for uh, African-Americans. The great migration lasts from the 1910s to the 1970s. So it was a long time, but um, essentially this is when exact same things that you uh, had back home you do but oftentimes uh, you're coming to a situation where basically uh, you're poor you can't get the stuff you want and so what you often have to do is just find substitutes and then you start looking at the food of your neighbors and start incorporating that and th that becomes soul food so it's the difference between having fresh peaches for your peach cobbler or canned peaches fresh uh, black eyed peas or dried um, and so that's what comes through. But then um, once people get secure and prosper, they remember the good times food of the old country, the celebration food. And to show off status, they start eating that more regularly. And think about it. When we encounter an immigrant group's food, what we think they're eating every day is usually the celebration food, especially in a restaurant, because a restaurateur wants to show off the very best of their culture. The everyday stuff will be there, but the very best of their culture. And I'm saying that's what soul food is. It's a mix of that. But we, we key in on the celebration stuff for good reason, because it's glorious. <laughs> because it's delicious. <laughs> well, Adrian, this is absolutely fascinating. I mean, just so much knowledge in a very short amount of time. I mean, my, my head's kind of spinning. We are getting a bunch of chatter in the chat. People are just saying how fascinating this is, how this is making them hungry. Um, but I did got, have a fun comment um, that is actually a good transition for our friend, Dave. So somebody in the chat has says, says that they want to be Dave in their next life, a chocolate historian. <laughs> so with Dave, with that intro, tell us how chocolate intersected in the African-American experience and how it came to the Americas. Well, you know, it, it's, it's fascinating that people are interested in this too. First of all, thank you for enjoying my job. I love my job. I wake up every day excited because I get to learn more and more and more and this education never stops. So really, so how did chocolate become part of our culture? So one of the things that you need to know is that cocoa is native to the Western Amazon basin. And you can see that highlighted right down there in the, uh, the uh, uh, ellipse down in the bottom uh, below the equator. Uh, cocoa was harvested originally for the pulp, which surrounds the beans. And it was that sweet pulp that was fermented to actually produce an alcoholic drink. And we don't really have any records of the cocoa bean being used to make chocolate, but one of the things that we believe is that somewhere along the way, cocoa beans wound up going near a fire, getting exposed to heat, and they started roasting. And that wonderful aroma that hopefully many of you have had a chance to experience when cocoa beans uh, start roasting um, was alluring to them. Uh, it made them want to explore the uses of the cocoa bean. So how did the cocoa beans spread from the Amazon basin up into and through Mexico in Central America. Well, seeds or more likely seedlings were actually carried into Southern Mexico and Central America. Uh, cacao needs a warm 
a moist climate to grow, which actually limits the different areas in which it could be farmed in what was then known in this area as Mesoamerica. And indigenous people like the Almacs, the Maya, the Toltecs, and the Aztecs learned how to successfully grow cacao, which was then traded and sold within the region. So how did chocolate make its way to Europe and then eventually to, Mer to America? Hernan Cortez arrived at the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan in 1519, where he was received by King Montezuma II, who actually mistook him for the prophesied god Quetzalcoatl. He regaled him in all kinds of wonderful gifts, and one of which was chocolate. Now, back then, chocolate was enjoyed as a drink. It was often usually served at room temperature. Now, Cortez liked it so much that he brought uh, cocoa beans and chocolate back to Spain with him when he arrived in 1529. Now, one of the most tragic and really horrible parts in the whole story of cacao farming was the global expansion of slavery. And this is not an easy topic for us to discuss. It's very sad, uh, but it's important for us to understand how uh, cacao expanded. Columbus was the first to enslave people in the island of Hispaniola when he landed in 1492. Other countries such as France, England, Portugal, um, also um, started enslaving uh, people and bringing them over to the new world. And by the 1600s, uh, different places like the Lesser Antilles, uh, St. Kitts, Antigua, uh, Martinique, Guadalupe, uh, were also um, using enslaved labor. Spain and the Netherlands also enslaved people in places like Venezuela, the Dominican Republic, Suriname, and Curaçao. And um, as you already heard um, Adrian mention, by the early 1600s, slavery arrived in the British colonies in North America. Now, enslaved people were both parts of the cacao trade, as well as, um, sorry, as human beings being traded for cacao as well as being sold specifically to be used on plantations where cacao was grown. So what cash crops were farmed via coercion and forced labor? Well, the primary crop was sugar. Other crops that were farmed included tobacco, coffee, corn, potatoes, rubber, and vanilla, and of course, cacao. Now, farmers would often grow more than one crop in case of crop failure or in case there were different impacts on the pricing of their crops. And by the 18th century, cacao was by far the most valuable commodity, and it was one of the region's top cash crops. So where was cacao grown and produced using enslaved labor? Well, almost all of the labor used to produce cash crops was uh, coerced. That's forced labor with little or no compensation. And most, especially by the early 18th century, was sadly enslaved. The largest uh, cacao producer was Brazil, and other producers included uh, colonies like Venezuela, Curaçao, Suriname, the Dutch West Indies, the Dominican Republic, Haiti, Jamaica, and even more colonies. So how were the enslaved used in farming? So, what did they do when they were there? Well, enslaved people were used to clear out the land. They were used to plant cacao. They were used to weed and prune the trees. Labor was used against multiple crops uh, like labor intensive sugar, and then also the seasonal harvesting of cacao. And cacao became a preferred crop to be worked by the aging enslaved people versus more demanding crops like sugar and tobacco. And the very young and the very old did what we would consider to be perhaps even later work. Women and youth were, youth were often used for weeding and the clearing of the fields. But unfortunately, the strongest of the enslaved were often used for the planting of the fields, the harvesting, as well as the planting of the crops. Well, Dave, you know, those are the hard stories. Um, to hear, but ones that we believe very strongly need to be told. So thank you for sharing um, that, that detailed history into um, cacao and um, the early African-American experience. 
Um, with that, I do have a couple questions that have come into the chat. So Adrian, if you want to unmute, <laughs> um, we have a question from the audience. What drew Adrian to study soul food? So the short answer is unemployment. Uh, the longer answer is I was in between jobs with the Clinton White House and coming back to Colorado because at the time I was thinking about this, I wanted to be the senator from Colorado. So I was trying to get back to Colorado and start my political career, but the job market was really slow. I was watching a lot of daytime television. I'm not even going to tell you what shows. And in the depth of my depravity, I, I just said, asked myself uh, or said to myself, I should read something. So I went to the bookstore and I was, I always love to cook. So I'm in the cookbook section and I see this book called Southern Food at Home on the Road in History by John Edgerton. Thought that was interesting. I opened the book up. It said the tribute to black achievement in American cookery has yet to be written. And the book was about 10 years old when I picked it up. So I just emailed him cold and I asked him, uh, you know, you wrote this a while ago. Do you still think this is true? And he said, yeah, for the most part, nobody's told that story. So with no qualifications at all, except for eating a lot of soul food and cooking it some, that's what launched me on the journey. Wow, that's fascinating. Congratulations. <laughs> that's really, really cool. So Dave, we have a chocolate related question for you. Someone asks, is it true that beans uh, that beans that are light roasted are cons are considered that because they have been roasted less? Um, it depends. So that, that's a, a two part answer here. So <laughs> yes, so beans can be roasted a few different ways, much like we do with coffee. You could do a light, a medium, and a dark roast, depending on what the flavors are you're trying to get out of the beans, which ultimately will go into whatever uh, product you're trying to create. So whatever your final chocolate is going to be. But it also has to do, and the second part is, where the beans are grown. So back on that uh, first chart that you saw the map, you saw all the different uh, gray ellipses on there. Um, and that's where the different cocoa growing regions exist. Cocoa beans in South America don't necessarily have the same characteristics and attributes as cocoa beans from say Africa and are different than the cocoa beans that you might find in Southeast Asia. So again, cocoa beans like any other plant is gonna pick up different attributes from its environment, the soil, the air, the climate um, and what's going on around it too. So again, you might get different color, uh, hues of the cocoa beans, uh, but in the end, I mean, you're gonna get a different blend of the finished product, your chocolate. But here's a fun fact, Kelly, let me tell this one too. I'll bet you folks out there didn't know that about three quarters of the world's cocoa supply does come from West Africa today, even though it started over in what was then the new world. So again, we mentioned already South America and up to Central, uh, uh, Central America and Mexico, but um, yeah, so fun little thing you can tell people. I love it. Well, as you know, we love history around here, but we also love to talk about food. So Adrian, I'm gonna hand it back over to you. Give us the anatomy of a soul food meal. Yeah, so the reason I um, go through this portion is because the way I organized my soul food book was to write a chapter about every part of a typical soul food meal uh, and describe what it is, how it gets on the soul food plate, and what it says for the culture. So those of you who are familiar with soul food culture, uh, even though you're on mute, please applaud. You can say amen, you know, whatever emotion evokes once you see these pictures. All right, let's go to the first one. So entrees, uh, fried chicken or chicken, which is either fried or smothered. If you're not familiar with smothered, uh, essentially it's like uh, getting raw chicken, flouring it with some seasoned flour, and then just frying it for a quick sear and then braising it in gravy until it falls apart. Um, then fried fish is often very popular. So African-Americans descend from a seafood loving people because they were coastal people, uh, a lot of them. Uh, and so African-Americans tend to eat seafood at, at a higher proportion than the rest of the population. Catfish was the most popular example, but um, because of the problems the catfish industry is having lately, it's become really expensive, uh, matching even the price of salmon most times of the year here in Denver. So people are switching to tilapia, whiting, and all, all kinds of fish. You find a lot of variety in, in with fish. All right, next slide. Variety meats. So these are the funky cuts of meat. These are the things like the ham hocks, the oxtails, the pork necks, the turkey tips. Uh, so uh, here you're looking at a tray of pork neck bones with rice and gravy. 
from a place called Bully Soul Food, which I love. It's in Jackson, Mississippi. So what cracks me up now is that now that other chefs are discovering these parts of the animal, you'll go to a fine dining restaurant. You're sitting down at a table next to someone. And they're just saying, oh, chef is just so amazing. Taking me to places I've never been before with food, honoring the whole animal. And I'm just thinking if you just went down to Adrian's Soul Shack, you could get the same thing and pay a third of the price. But, you know, that's how it plays out. Chitlins. Chitlins are pig intestines, not for everybody. Um, and people object to them because of what they are, pig intestines, and also because of the a powerful smell that comes when either cleaning them or cooking them. Now, I consider that smell a perfume, but I need counseling. A lot of people are just offended by the smell. But this is my family's chitlin pots. I have chitlins two times a year, Thanksgiving and New Year's Day. So it's just family tradition. I don't really eat them that often. Side dishes. So uh, in soul food, the popular greens are collard, kale, mustard, turnip, and cabbage. So if you've discovered kale in the last five to 10 years, welcome to the party because we've been eating them for about 300. Uh, and what you'll find is that greens are a very important part of West African cuisine. And so uh, you couldn't grow those tropical greens in a temperate climate. And so what West African cooks did at some point is just substituted the bitter greens of Europe for uh in their in their diet so that's why greens are hugely popular black eyed peas the black eyed peas are actually a bean they're native to west africa and they come um so when i earlier when i was talking about the enslaved people growing things so you know foods like uh black eyed peas okra bene seeds which are sesame seeds those things are uh, are african plants that they grew in their gardens and helped introduce those foods. And other, if you're uh, immersed in soul food or Southern culture, you know that I have greens and black eyed peas on this slide because we're supposed to eat them on New Year's Day for either good luck, prosperity, or uh, black eyed peas for coins, and then the greens for folding money. I have been extremely devoted to this tradition all of the years of my life, and I could say that the prosperity results are very mixed. <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh -huh. Also, candy jam. So what we call yams in this country are dark flesh sweet potatoes. They are not tropical yams. And they're a gimmick of some Louisiana farmers. So in the 1920s, some Louisiana farmers decided they wanted a, a distinctive sweet potato on the market. So they bred a sweet potato with a darker orange flesh, higher sugar content, and more water, uh, you know, higher water content. And they called those yams which causes all kinds of lingu linguistic confusion. But that's why you can go to a grocery store and see a big old bin and it'll have sweet potatoes on one side and yams on the other. Botanically speaking, they're the same plant, just different varieties. Um, but yeah, the way you make candy jams is essentially you either bake or boil, you know, cut them up, bake them or boil them, and then you're just braising them in a very sweet gravy of butter, sugar, cinnamon, you know, those kind of things. Uh, macaroni and cheese. Now, I wasn't going to include macaroni and cheese in my book because I thought it was too universal, but so many of my black friends threatened, threatened to slap me upside my head that I succumbed to peer pressure. Um, and mac and cheese has a really interesting history. The earliest recipe goes back to the 1390s, and it was in the royal cookbook for Richard II and Queen Elizabeth I. So um, the, the early recipe was just the noodles, shaved Parmesan, and butter. So over time, cream and other elements get added until it becomes the goopy mess that we love today. So the way that it enters African-American cuisine is that essentially it's royalty food and then it becomes rich people's food. It's going down the social ladder. And then when wealthy Americans would go to Europe and encounter it, uh, they fell in love with it in the homes of wealthy Europeans and brought it back to the U.S. And in the South, uh, often it was enslaved cooks who were doing the cooking. So that's how it really enters our diet. Soul food bread. So there's certainly wheat bread in soul food tradition, but I think cornbreads are the most iconic. So this is uh, some cornbread muffins. If you're having over at my place and I'm making you cornbread, I'm going to make some buttermilk cornbread in a cast iron skillet. So you're going to get a nice wedge from me. Um, or, you know, I could make it in a pan, give you a nice square as well. But corn sticks, there's something called hot water cornbread where essentially you get the cornmeal, minimal seasoning, and then you get scalding hot water pour it into that cornmeal mix and then it stiffens it and then so you form patties and then fry it in shallow grease and serve it. And that's very close to what the Native Americans, uh, how they made their uh, their early cornbreads. Uh, spoon bread is a type of cornbread, it's a cornbread souffle. And then one of my fanciful ones is hush puppies. If you don't know about hush puppies, they're essentially fried cornmeal balls that are seasoned. And the story for the name goes like this. Some people are out in the woods they're doing something. Somebody's tasked with going to the nearby river and fishing for dinner. 
they do that they get the they have their cornmeal you know they're frying it up and um in this big big old pot with full of lard and then basically the pets are going nuts because they smell all this good fish cooking and so someone decides to take some extra cornmeal uh, moisten it ball it up fry it and give it to the dogs in order to hush the puppies oh my so gosh that's, how, that's where it comes from yeah so your that. next cocktail party if the conversation gets a little slow you can drop that story <laughs> and i'll credit it to you <laughs> yeah, sure. thank you uh hot sauce is big in uh, soul food culture now tabasco is the world's best-selling hot sauce i'm not a huge tabasco fan because it doesn't have enough kick and seasoning for me, but a lot of people love it, right? Because it's the world's best seller. Um, you got trapez, uh, pepper vinegar. Now, pepper vinegar is something I only really see on the uh, East Coast a lot. Um, and essentially, it's a renewable resource. So what you would do is you get a container, fill it with chilies, and then pour in vinegar, close the container, let it stay there until it got as spicy as you wanted it to be. Uh, and then you'd season your food with it. And then it's a renewable resource because once you run out of vinegar, you just add some more. Um, but I like the uh, hot sauces that are kind of more like Crystal, Frank's, Louisiana brand, Red Rooster here, where it's thicker. It's like the mashed up cayenne pepper uh, or red peppers, whatever kind of red pepper, uh, vinegar and, and spice. Uh, in fact, this is healthcare. Uh, in In the 1800s, in 1700s even, this was the cure for strep throat. They would tell you to gargle with cops, a capsicum gargle, and it was essentially mashed chili peppers and vinegar. Turn around any bottle of hot sauce. That's the that's the essential formula. Wow. Okay, red drinks. Now you have to understand in, in soul food culture, red is a color and a flavor. So black people don't get caught up in calling something cherry or strawberry that it has hints of cranberry. It's just red. Uh, <laughs> but I think red Kool-Aid is the official soul food drink. Now, there is a generational shift happening. There's a lot of youngins that seem to like purple and blue. And as I write in my book, I do believe the children are our future, that we should teach them well and let them lead the way, but not on Kool-Aid because they're messing it up. Um, but you've, you've had two uh, red drinks from Africa and you probably didn't even know it. The first is hibiscus. The hibiscus plant is native to West Africa. They have a drink they call bisop, which is essentially water with the flower petals put in to color it red and then sweetened to taste. And that drink comes across the, slave, uh, the Atlantic with the slave trade, takes root in Jamaica where it's called sorrel. So if you've ever been in the Caribbean and had sorrel, it's more of a Christmas time drink there because that's when the, the plant blooms, the flowers bloom. Um, but yeah, sorrel. And then it makes its way around Latin America and South America. So if you go to a taqueria and have flor de Jamaica or agua de Jamaica, so Jamaica flour or Jamaica water, you're drinking a riff off a West African drink. And a lot of Latinos don't know that. Um, and actually, a lot of people don't even know that. But I, I did a presentation earlier today where I presented that. And this Latino was like, no, no, that's ours. We and he's like, oh, wait a minute. And he translated it. And he's like, it's Jamaica water. I never even thought about that. So, um, And the other one's cola. Cola nuts are white or red, native to West Africa. They were a stimulant uh, and a wonder drug in the 1800s. So they were brought across the Atlantic during the slave trade as well. And in West African societies, there's a cola nut tea. It's the same formula, water. Drop the red nuts in, sweeten it to taste. So I think it's the same formula as Kool-Aid. That's why I say these are precursors. Um, one of the things that's fun is people get in arguments about me about what I didn't include. And sweet tea comes up a lot. But to me, sweet tea is more Southern. You don't see sweet tea that much in soul food restaurants outside the South. Now, you do see it more outside the South now because we've got McDonald's, Chick-fil-A, all of these fast food chains are now including sweet tea on the menu. So I'm convinced that sweet tea will lose its Southern identity in about 10 years or so, because that's what happened to Coca-Cola. 50 years ago, people thought Coca-Cola uh, was a, a Southern drink. They associated it with, with Georgia. Nobody does that now. Let's go through the soul food desserts real quick. And what we find is that there's a common riff. Basically, these soul food desserts are a nod to old British desserts. So there's sweet potato pie, which is the same process and spicing as carrot pie. Peach cobbler um, shows up in the 1800s. Um, that, that's probably more American. We don't really see a precursor in, in British food for peach cobbler. And last but not least, oh, here comes some more. Wow. Yeah. Banana pudding <laughs> is, a, is a riff off the old British dessert, a trifle. And so a trifle with some bread component with cream. And so the bread here is vanilla wafer cookies. And then the cream is the custard or jello pudding that you would make topped with, with the meringue. So I am being very vulnerable here because this is a banana pudding, banana pudding that I made. And you can see that my meringue game is not tight, uh, but I'm working <laughs> on it. 
And then pound cake <laughs> on the other. Just focus on the pound cake. It's a long story. I was at a all you can eat buffet. They were about to close the dessert section, so I just grabbed everything. But just focus on the pound cake. And pound cake is a old British dessert. Pound of flour, pound of butter, pound of sugar. And I find that a lot of soul food cooks are, even though this uh, uh, recipe is so simple, a lot of soul food cooks are very proud of their uh, pound cake recipes. Nice. And then one of the best chocolate desserts in the soul food canon is red velvet cake. Velvet cakes have been around for a while, um, and it was a signal to the diner that you're about to get a very soft cake. But eventually, towards the late 1800s, they started adding cocoa. And the way that cocoa interacted with the other ingredients, like vinegar and other things, gave it a reddish color. And so uh, then it was called red velvet cake. And there are a lot of early references to calling it devil's food cake with red coloring or something like that. You see that in some early African-American cookbooks. So red velvet cake has become one of the soul food standards. Oh, I love it. I am a huge fan of red velvet cake. Okay, we are gonna dive into trends, but I had to share some of the comments that we've been getting. It is hilarious. You are getting a lot of amens, a lot of amen. <laughs> uh, we had one, one viewer tell us that fried fish, that the fried fish looks delicious. They can't wait until Friday. Um, someone else tells us, I grew up with this in the South. Um, chitlins, I'll pass on LOL, but my mom used to cook them. And then this is my favorite. My mom tried to clean chitlins in the washing machine. <laughs> I, I have no words. I have no words. <laughs> so the question is, did they use the washing machine after that? Well, we need that person to now comment and answer Adrian's questions and we will come back with that. We will report live. <laughs> um, so Adrian, I just before we go into trends in soul food, I do want to remind folks, make sure to go onto Instagram go find American Heritage Chocolate's last post and post a comment to be entered to win our contest. We have been getting a lot of um, great posts on Instagram, but we'd love to uh, make sure we have lots of people entered to win. So with that, Adrian, tell me about soul food innovation. Yeah, so one dish that uh, I like to talk about is uh, fried chicken and waffles. So these are kind of the interesting things that show up in soul food. So this is a red velvet waffle because we know that color red does not exist in the culinary world, right? So some red food coloring goes at it. So the story is that chicken and waffles uh, was birthed in Harlem in the 1920s as people are coming out of the jazz clubs too early uh, for breakfast, but too late for dinner because it was like two in the morning. So this guy named Joseph Wells decided to combine breakfast and dinner and create chicken and waffles. It's a great marketing myth because it's not true. Chicken and waffles actually comes from old Europe. G German immigrants brought a creamed chicken and waffle tradition to the US and eventually that creamed chicken became fried chicken in the South. And so uh, that's where it comes from. So people were eating uh, chicken and waffles as early as the 1800s, the early 1800s. Uh, so I think it fell out of favor and that's what created the space for uh, Joseph Wells to do his uh, marketing ploy. All right, I just had to warn you all, just brace yourself. Ladies and gentlemen, the kool lickle known as the Kool-Aid pickle. All right, if you don't know what a Kool-Aid pickle is, here's how you make one. You get a jar of already made kosher dill pickles, take the pickles out, poke holes in them, either cut them or, uh, it, or poke holes in them or cut them, make Kool-Aid out of the pickle brine, so that pickle juice, and then you put the pickles back in, close the jar, leave it there for two weeks, take them out and eat them. If you like the taste of pickles and of Kool-Aid, it's just a sweet and sour combination. Okay, Kelly, I see you're getting queasy. Just hold on. Um, if you don't like this, this is one of the nastiest things you'll ever put in your mouth. So the question is, where does this come from? Yes, next slide. So when I was interviewing elders, they told me that they would do this. They would, as little kids, they would go to the corner store, get these huge pickles, cut off the tip, and then they would get peppermint sticks with a hole in it and put it into the soft part of the pickle, let the pickle juice dissolve it, and then they would suck on it. And they would do, if they didn't have peppermint sticks, they would use Jawbreakers, Jolly Ranchers, any hard candy will do. Um, and some hardcore people would pour either Kool-Aid powder or pixie, dicks, uh, pixie stick dust uh, on there. So that was hardcore. So it's just kids messing around. Hardcore, for real. <laughs> Nashville hot chicken is very trendy. It starts with an African-American couple. Basically, there was a known womanizer and true to form, he cheated on his woman. And she was a very good cook, so she decided to get back at him by making his favorite thing. Uh, uh, fried chicken and she made a super spicy version of it to burn his mouth out and he took one bite and loved it. So they ended up opening a restaurant called Princess Hot Chicken. It's in Nashville to this day. So whenever anybody talks about 
Nashville Hot Chicken. They're talking about Prince's, an African American okay. restaurant. Got it. Uh, Los Angeles got the prize for the weirdest soul food. So I went to this place called Tony's Soul Burger and I had a Thanksgiving burger. Here's a Thanksgiving burger. Whole wheat bun, all turkey patty, slice of cheese, a piece of turkey bacon, a layer of cornbread dressing, a layer of cranberries, a layer of sweet potato casserole, a fried egg, a layer of collard greens, whole wheat bun. Slamming. Wow. Then I had to went to a place called Soul Dog and I had a soul food hot dog. Here's a soul food hot dog. Bun, wiener, collard green and cucumber relish, sweet potato puree drizzle, crumbled bacon bits. Slamming. So Soul Dog actually had a mural. So if you remember good times when the credits were rolling, they had a mural that essentially was a replica of that, except everybody has a hot dog instead of a pool cue. Unfortunately, <laughs> both of those restaurants closed. I was so sad because I just thought it was so innovative. Soul food trends. Let's just go through the trends really quickly. So in addition to the traditional soul food, there's down home healthy, which essentially is taking out the fat, the salt, you know, the sugar uh, to make a, a healthier version. Because remember, people were focusing more on the celebration food aspect of it than other things. Um, and so uh, here's a, new, a riff on catfish, uh, one of the most popular recipes in my book. This is called Creole broiled catfish. So you get a catfish filet, rub, rub it in olive oil, and then put on your favorite Creole seasoning and then broil it for seven minutes till it's just opaque. Um, very popular. Now, um, this recipe is one from, a, uh, we can back up for a second. This recipe is from an ex-girlfriend, so I wanna pause and just give a pro tip because we here at the Mars Wrigley family care about your holistic happiness. So if you're in a relationship with somebody who's a good cook, you know, do what you can to stay with that person. But if you notice that the relationship is getting rocky, I can tell you from personal experience, it's a lot easier to get their recipes before you break up. Good to know. <laughs> yeah. Upscale soul food is the exact opposite of downhill healthy, right? It's like exotic spices, you know, duck fat, heirloom vegetables, heritage meat, presentation emphasized, and then, you know, charge you a lot of money. But the strongest uh, category right now where the most creativity is, is in the vegan category. So this is a place called Solely Vegan in Oakland, California, moving from left to right, Southern fried tofu, vegan mac and cheese, vegan collard greens, and a cayenne pepper lemonade. Tofu was shaped to look like fried chicken, but reminded me of fried fish. I thought it was good. The, the vegan mac and cheese, because there's no dairy in vegan, they used almond cheese and almond milk. So it just wasn't creamy. Um, and it had the texture of stuffed tortellini, if you've ever had that. So that's what it reminded me of. It was okay, but not what I think of with mac and cheese. But the collards were as good as any, because if you um, know how to season vegetables, you can make them uh, and you know you don't even miss the meat. Uh, fusion is going on, playing around with uh, eth other ethnic cuisines. So there's a guy in Atlanta who calls himself the Blacksican. Don't get mad at me. That's what he calls himself. Um, he's doing things like uh, collard, ge collard green quesadilla, you know, just playing around with the format. Um, and then you've got a soul roll. And a soul roll is a soul food uh, filled egg roll. And so this one is uh, chicken, rice, and gravy. But there's ones with mac and cheese, candy jams collard greens, a combination of all the above. So you're seeing that more and more. Wow. And finally, I'm going to end with soul food in space. Uh, so you may not know this, but there are a group of people living on a volcano in Hawaii. And um, basically, they are living in a module. They, If they leave, they have to wear a space suit because they're trying to mimic the conditions on Mars. And so the idea is like, if we're going to have a peopled mission to Mars, what is that going to, what toll is that going to take physically? psychologically and all this sense. But one of the things they have to figure out is how they're gonna feed themselves because they're not gonna be able to carry enough food on the journey to Mars. First of all, it's gonna take a year to get there at least, probably even more depending on when they leave Earth. And so the ship would be too heavy to leave the Earth's atmosphere. And so um, they gotta figure out how they're gonna grow food along the way. And so this is where soul food comes into play because they're looking at dark leafy greens. They're looking at sweet potatoes okra, hibiscus, all of these things they're looking at. And then also this volcano in Hawaii has very similar soil to the one in Mars. So that's a great place to try to figure out what they can grow. Um, so I actually got to go to Johnson Space Control and visit with the food scientists who work on this kind of stuff. And I had a fascinating lunch with them and I learned a couple of things, but these things are non-starters. So the first is, you know, you can't have cornbread in space. The reason why is because cornbread crumbles so in a zero gravity environment, 
uh, it's just going to crumble and your spaceship's going to be straight nasty, right? Because there's just going to be crumbs everywhere. And the other one I learned is that chitlins is a non-starter in space because you can't roll down the window. <laughs> so thank you. That's my, that's my brief tour of kind of soul food trends. So thanks. Oh my gosh, that is absolutely fascinating. Um, I've got my sweet tea. I mean, I, I don't have any red drink, but I, I have my sweet tea. Um, so More Adrian, we got, a, we got a bunch of really fun comments coming in. I just want to share them with you. First of all, we did hear back from the chitlins washing machine lady <laughs> i guess it was her mom not her yeah, yeah she says yes she says yes we did use the washing machine after but it required cleaning thank you audrey for sharing that very very um uh, fascinating question or fa fascinating fun fact um so another question we have here is do all red velvet cakes require food coloring no. So what you're finding is a lot of people just to have a healthier riff, they're using beets or they're trying to find natural coloring for the red. I mean, you want to get red somehow. And so uh, it's actually less frequent to see the red um, nowadays. And one thing I want to note is, um, you know, there are different permutations of a red velvet cake. And I have to say the chocolate, the most chocolate ones um, in terms of appearance and taste were in Los Angeles. And I'm, I'm not sure why that is. Um, but that was something I did notice when I was eating my way through the country. Interesting. Well, we also have another viewer named Julia, and she says the hibiscus aid recipe in Adrian's book is amazing. I teach his book, and the, and she actually makes the hibiscus aid popsicles. Yes, that's my friend Julia from Oklahoma. Yes, thanks Julia for weighing in. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a bomb recipe. That's a bomb drink. It's a very good drink. All right, I'm gonna add that to my list. Speaking of drinks, Dave, just to weave in one more chocolate fun fact. Tell us about when, how chocolate came to us, whether, you know, was, I, I believe it was a drink longer than it's been a candy, correct? Yeah, it's uh, exactly right, Kelly. So, you know, for over 3,500 years, we, we drank our chocolate. We still do it again today, but we never thought of it as anything but a drink until the first chocolate bar was actually made in 1847. And actually, here's another fun one too, Kelly. The first milk chocolate bar was actually made in 1876. So in that 3,500 year of chocolate, really it's been pretty recent that we started actually eating our chocolate like you see here and baking with our chocolate. So again, if you enjoy chocolate like this, that's fantastic. But don't forget, you can bake with this stuff too and have fantastic desserts. Excellent. So we have a winner of our fabulous um, Adrian Miller basket. Again, I just want to remind folks that both of his books, uh, Soul Food Scholar, which he shared from tonight, and his fascinating book, The President's Kitchen Cabinet. Sorry, you know, technology. Um, this is an amazing, amazing book. And it actually tells the story of the African Americans who fed all of our first families from the Washingtons to the Obamas. So bringing to light their stories, their names, their recipes. I just, this is, this is the book that brought us together, right, Adrian? So I was at a book signing for this. Um, so I would like to announce, I'm first gonna read the winning comment and then I'll, I'll, I'll read the, the, the winner. Um, so let me see. Our winner is Joanne Diaz Klebor. Did I get that right? Joanne Diaz Kleber, if you are out there, give us a hey on YouTube. We're also going to DM you on, um, on our Instagram to let you know. Um, here's her comment. She says, thank you for sharing such a dis dif different aspect of Black history. So I think that, you know, that that is our goal here today. And gosh, Adrian, I mean, you've really just kind of got me started on, I know we could talk a lot longer about this, but I really appreciate you making time to chat with Dave and myself and with our audience here. Folks, if you want to learn more about Adrian, go to soulfoodscholar.com. And if you want to learn more about chocolate's history, please visit americanheritagechocolate.com. Otherwise, have a great night and cheers. Bye, everybody. All right. Nice to be with you. Have a good night.